critical window. Years ago, NASA and Boeing did research to determine at what point is an airplane truly out of control. Now that's important to our discussion of an airplane offset, and I'm going to go ahead and show you the factors right here. These are called the quantitative loss of control criteria, the QLC. And we already talked about a couple of them. We talked about the attitude, the pitch and bank. We talked about airspeed a little bit. Uh, here they talk about a structural integrity or alpha, beta, angle of attack and side slip. The bottom line is, is as opposed to diving into what these are, the most important point of this was, is that when they did their research, they had determined that from the amount of time it takes for the airplane to go to the first criteria being met, let's say that's a pitch of 25 degrees nose up, to the point where three were occurring simultaneously. Now the reason why three matters is that three of these elements were occurring simultaneously was an indication that the pilot was no longer in control of the airplane. So. This study that they did based on the accidents at that time, the loss control and flight commercial aviation accidents, what they found was the average time that it took for the first criteria, and I use 25 degrees nose up as an example, for the third criteria to exist in these accidents was anywhere between two and 12 seconds. Two and 12 seconds. So here's the thing. If we believe that preventing loss of control is critical, which we do, or more importantly, preventing the occurrence of an airplane upset, then we really need to make sure that we are paying attention to what's going on and taking effective action prior to the conditions of an airplane upset presenting themselves. Because if we don't and we let bank or pitch or roll or speed get to the point where it qualifies for an airplane upset, statistics show that the airplane can be out of control as little as 2 to 12 seconds later. So that is motivation, number one, not to be there in the first place, but it's also motivation that should you get to that situation, is that you know exactly what to do to recover the airplane. And it's not as simple as you might think, as we're going to talk about uh, throughout this video presentation. Okay, We call this 10 seconds to survive loss of control in flight. And remember, it's not about creating a sense of fear. It's motivating you to understand that my number one job as a pilot is not to get to a situation where I only have 10 seconds to survive, which is truly the case when you're dealing with upset recovery. However, should you get there, you know that you need to know exactly what to do and how to do it to affect recovery because you don't have a lot of time. And we're going to talk about the uh, integration of strategy and an approach to addressing loss of control that is effective at wide diversity of situations later in the presentation. Okay, let's go ahead to 15 seconds back from the loss of control in flight situation in our video. Okay, so remember 15 seconds, it's now entering the condition of an airplane upset that can be happening. And once that occurs, as little as two to 12 seconds later, the airplane can be out of control. Contact Miami Tower on 118.3. Got to get slope here, but this wind is this wind is way stronger than they're calling it. Damn altitude. Ah, uh, oh, got it really high. And Miami Tower, uh, Phenom Nine Mike Kilos with you outside of Long. Autopilot. Whoa. Autopilot. Whoa. Pull up. Ah. 500. Pull up. As John realizes he's about to lose control of the airplane, his mind flashes back to a recurrent training session. Remember, John, you fly the airplane, don't let it fly you. We're going to recognize and confirm the situation. Be sure your autopilot's off. Reduce your angle of attack. Apply nose down pitch until the warning cues are eliminated. John realizes it's time to get out in front of his airplane. And with a renewed confidence, he knows exactly what the next move needs to be. Okay, so he knows exactly what the next move is going to be. Well, how does he know that? If you're actually watching the video, you're probably wondering how a pilot that got himself into this situation actually knows what the next move is going to be and make it a correct one. And, and that's, unfortunately, that's, that's the way these things develop. It has nothing really to do with the pilot the airplane, or necessarily even as training. There's uh, factors associated with this situation that can lead up and compound any one of us at any time to be in a situation 
where we need to address loss of control in flight. Okay, let's now talk about a concept called threat and error management. Threat and error management is really, really important because what it is is a process by which we as pilots understand what's going on in the environment, but it's not just situations being presented to us. It's the result of situations where we address either inappropriately or we don't take action, but there's a consequence. And threat and error management is a recognition that there's going to be things that happen that pop up that we as pilots can train to overcome, but there's also going to be situations that we aren't able to control. For example, in a crew situation, the other pilot doing something or putting the airplane into a situation that was unexpected, okay? So as a result of that error, now we have a threat that we have to overcome. So let's take a look at this. Threat and error management is a concept that seeks to minimize safety risks, thereby maximizing safety margins. So safety margin is a critical part of this. In the threat and error management concept, pilots considers not only the external influences that impact safety, but also their own reactions and mistakes as well. So important, because very often in our training, we feel that as long as we are doing things right, the only thing we have to worry about is going to be the external things that happen to us, whether that be wake turbulence, when of course that's really a threat. But the part of this is, is that we can be the issue as well. There's human factors, decision making, and issues that can develop because of what we do or don't do in the cockpit. Okay, so when we consider all these factors, uh, this is why the threat and error management is a, st a distinct advantage over the previous way of approaching air safety. So what does that look like to us? Uh, is we want to avoid the error. In other words, we wanna make good decisions. We wanna see them. We wanna be able to take actions. We wanna be able to trap those errors, okay? To contain them before they develop into something. And when they do develop into something, the final layer of protection is going to be mitigating the consequences of that error effectively to keep the airplane back into the heart of the envelope and get it back on the ground safety. Okay, so in the presentation that follows, we're going to address these areas through a few different concepts. The first one is going to be this perception we have as pilots that we are invulnerable. And I know that none of us would probably consciously say that we feel like we are completely invulnerable, but the reality is, is that we are all vulnerable and understanding that we can be vulnerable is the first step in being aware of situations that can develop that we may not be fully ready for. Trapping the air. Trapping the error is critical, but if we don't notice the error because we're distracted, can lead us to a situation where we have to take effective recovery. So we're gonna talk about the concept of distraction as well. Now, when it comes to mitigating the consequences of the error, their awareness, skill, and knowledge are absolutely critical, okay? And we're going to address that because recognition, taking effective action is critical, and then we're gonna talk about how to now intercept through the manual application of technique to overcome the situation through upset recovery and upset prevention. So there's a few um, resources out in the industry now. AC120109, the stall template, has been very recently uh, upgraded to AC120109A. Now, 120109 was approach to stall training, but the most important step forward for the industry in that resource was that the approach to stall and the stall were now treated the same way. So the inclusion of 109A is simply now the integration of full stall recovery. Fortunately, because of the introduction of AC120109, the stall template is now it wasn't new information. The focus on reducing angle of attack was now understood and that came out in 2012. And the most recent version of 109A came out in late 2015, early 2016. So what's its critical focus? It's the reduction of angle of attack. It's not minimizing altitude loss anymore. Remember that whole technique and the approach to stall of take your attitude and hold it and add power to get out of it? Well, that is all gone now. The focus should be on reducing angle of attack to get back in control of the airplane. Okay, it considers the airplane commonalities, but also their differences. It's a best practice. It talks about where and when to apply it and who should apply it, the operators and training centers. In fact, if you're doing approach to stall training or even full stall training, it absolutely has to be in compliance with this resource, AC120109A. So the process, the template addresses these areas. It talks about recognizing and confirming the situation. Make sure that you're actually in a stall. Then disconnect the autopilot and auto throttles if it's supported by the manufacturer of the airplane. 
nose down pitch control. That's the reducing angle of attack part until the stall warning is gone. Using trim to support that action is required. Then once you're in control, reducing the bank angle, adjusting your thrust and power and considerations such as speed brakes management, and returning to the desired flight path and stabilizing the airplane. So very, very important. Now this may seem obvious to anybody who's current in the aviation industry, but most importantly, minimizing altitude loss is a thing of the past. It still matters, but it is absolutely not the number one priority in stall recovery. Okay, there's what the template looks like. And today we're gonna to be fo focusing on the reduction of angle of attack. So the highlighted blue area, or correction, the highlighted yellow area that we have here is the section where it talks about reducing angle of attack and then the rationale for why it is doing it. Now, for everybody who wants to go ahead and take a look at this document, I made it easy. Uh, up on the top right, you can see tinyurl.com AC120-109. AC120-109. Type that into your browser and you can download that uh, right now. And I would suggest looking at that one and then going looking at the more modern one, which is 109A. Okay, now we go to now the ICAO manual and upset trading. Now you may or may not be aware of it, but in 2014, after five years of research and study by organizations around the world and experts from over a hundred different areas of aviation and a hundred individuals and 40 plus organizations, ICAO produced what is called the ICAO manual on airplane upset prevention and recovery training. And in that it talks about techniques. In this particular section, we're talking about the nose high recovery. And remember how in the stall reducing angle of attack was critical? Well, take a look at this. Is that in the nose high situation, pushing or reducing angle of attack is also critical. It's really, really important in a nose high situation that you are managing angle of attack. Traditionally, pilots have been taught to roll nose high. Now, rolling can help get the lift vector down. It can help keep more energy or controllability on the airplane. But the number one threat when we are in a nose high situation is not hitting the ground. The number one threat nose high is stalling the airplane. How do we increase our safety margin? Remember part of threat and error management is increasing safety management or increasing safety margins is we push and reduce angle of attack which now expands our safety margin because by reducing the load or G on the airplane the stall speed goes down. Okay, if the stall speed goes down, that means that we could fly even at the 1G stall speed if we're unloaded, not to zero or negative G, but to a light positive G. If we are unloaded in the airplane, now getting to the stall speed in this situation is no longer a threat of the stall as long as we are reducing angle of attack when we get to that situation. So as we can see from the template, uh, is that pushing forward, okay, and reducing angle of attack is very important nose high. Okay, let's now go on to the ICAO manual uh, on section 3.5, which is the nose low recommendation. And again, I put the tiny URL reference and take a look at the top. It's tinyurl.com slash 111-100-11, okay, ICAO 10011. And this is now talking about the lows, nose low recommendations, okay? And so everybody believes that, of course, if an airplane is nose low, well then surely pulling back is what we gotta do to recover, right? We're nose low. But the problem is, why did you get there? Why are you nose low? And it's very often due to the fact that the airplane is stalled, because if you are stalled and you're nose low, pulling only makes it worse. What you have to do, in fact, is push and reduce angle of attack to realign the airflow, reattach the airflow to the wings to have control, and then very cautiously and judiciously start recovering the airplane by then coming back. The point is, is that reducing angle of attack again is very important to being effective in dealing with an airplane upset in a nose low situation. So we can see now that angle of attack management or that pushing or reduction of angle of attack is important not only in stall, but also nose high, and also nose low. And as it turns out in many, many other situations associated with loss control beyond just these three scenarios, that managing and assessing angle of attack is very often the very first thing that you need to do once you've made the decision to take control of the airplane to affect recovery. So let's keep that in mind. So pushing and reducing angle of attack is correct.